Welcome back to Decouple. For those of you watching on YouTube, you can see I've got a pretty large grin underneath this, uh, this soup strainer on my face, and that is because we are rejoined by the one, the only, Mark Nelson, uh, Decouple fan favorite, um, who has been on a temporary hiatus, uh, but delighted to bring you back on, Mark. I've been um, well, but I, I stayed away because you have a new favorite, James Krellenstein, and when, when daddy rejects you, it's hard to come back and talk to him about the grid. <laughs> oh, Mark, let's not get into daddy issues right now. But uh, suffice it to say, uh, the people have been clamoring. Um, you know, I, I do get a lot of feedback and, and you've been missed. So but by more people than just myself. Um, but Mark, uh, really excited to have you back today. You reached out uh, wanting to discuss the state of affairs of the grid uh, in California. Um, and, you know, I'm always remarking on the, the sheer volume of modeling studies that are coming out. Uh, you know, and that's one way to sort of project what's to come in the future or help us decide on, on what to do. And we've indeed done a great episode on modeling. Um, but we have a lot of sort of real world experiments, um, which are occurring and, and California is, is one of those. And so, um, we've been kind of following along with great interest over the years, but we haven't, uh, delved into it recently. And I think, uh, there are some, some developments that, uh, you're going to help fill us in on today. Um, just a couple observations from my part of the world. Uh, I heard that the life extension work on Diablo Canyon is, is moving in the right direction, despite a number of, I think, Democratic Senate candidates still uh, lining up uh, in opposition of the continued operations at the plant. I've heard things around uh, rooftop solar subsidies being cut and that generating a certain amount of blowback. Um, and given the sort of general popularity of rooftop solar, I think it's, it's interesting that the decision was made to actually... Um, start cutting those subsidies back. I've heard the snowpack is uh, amazing. Skiing in Northern California is absolutely incredible right now. Um, I believe hydroelectric capacity was reduced by 50%, uh, I think in the kind of 2015 window. Um, so that's good news for California. Uh, but that's that's kind of all I've been you know, following in my peripheral vision. Uh, so again, excited to have you here to, uh, to provide a, a much more detailed case of, of uh, a place that you used to call home before you fled to nuclear power. Chicago. Yeah, thanks for that intro, Chris. Um, I still suffer from California derangement syndrome. I left years ago, and if I get into the wrong conversation at a cocktail party, I completely forget to go on and on about nuclear energy. It turns into just uh, rants about California, trying to understand what I witnessed and what's still happening out there. So just to explain, I moved to California in 2016. I lived in downtown San Francisco for four uh, four and a half years and left in the middle of the pandemic and uh, staying away from the social issues there in California, I went to enough meetings of the California Public Utilities Commission, the organization led by five governor of California appointed commissioners that oversees a range of uh, crucial activities in the state, most famously the grid itself, the power grid that it uh, caused me to go a little bit crazy. And I know that people are probably aware of what a Cassandra is. This uh, woman, Cassandra, was a uh, seer who was given the gift and the curse of foresight um, in Greek mythology. She was a, a priestess, I believe, in, uh, in Troy. And she was given the foresight to see what was coming to Troy, the ruin that was coming to Troy, and then was cursed with the inability to let anybody understand what was coming. So any of her warnings sound like completely incomprehensible babble. So uh, then her story ends really, really badly and tragically. And I'm not trying to say I see either as clearly as she did or ramble as incoherently as she did, and I hopefully won't die like she did, but I do feel a little sense of I warned you, bro. I told you about net energy metering, bro. I told you about nuclear plant shutdowns, bro. A lot of bad things are coming to fruition in California, and their electricity costs are exploding faster than almost anyone could have imagined. Like if I had been forced to say, how quickly do I think costs are going to explode in California? Even as a California Cassandra, I, do, I just don't think I would have, I don't think I could have been a chicken little hard enough to predict the costs that we're seeing now. And let me explain a little bit about those costs. Um, 
I don't know how much ancient history we're going to go into uh, leading up to the Enron debacle of, uh, at this point, 25 years ago. But California had an enormous amount of costs, an explosion of costs that that escalated its power well above national rates in 2000, 2001, 2002. But then costs were stable for many years. Um, some things that we're putting into place today's problems were happening then, but the, the costs weren't showing up and the rest of the United States had electricity costs that were approaching. That brings us up to 2010, 11, 12. 2010, 11, 12, electricity costs in California uh, on average, meaning the industrial electricity, residential and commercial electricity costs all averaged, were about 20, 25% above national average. In the 10 years since the closure of San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. Although costs have escalated in the rest of the U.S., costs in California are now double that of the USA, meaning the costs are escalating many times faster than that in the rest of the U.S. And if you look at the statements out of the California regulator, they'll say things like, well, we're recovering from the pandemic. Well, guess what? Everybody's recovering from the pandemic. They say, oh, we have the wildfires. Well, you know what? A lot of states have natural issues. They have issues with hurricanes. They have issues with tornadoes. Are wildfires bad? Yes. Are they? Can they be linked directly to electricity? Yes. But that meant that the management of that system ended up in, well, in hindsight, depending on which Cassandra you couldn't understand, ended up being extremely important and was neglected. And you can say it was neglected by the utilities, or you could say it's neglected by the regulator. In the end, Part of the story of California is the breakdown of clear responsibility for energy issues in the state. The escalation of costs this year, I've seen a lot of people say, because they, they went up 20, 25% or so in one year for electricity. Uh, when I've seen people talk about it, they say, oh, well, PG&E, one of the large regulated utilities residing in a state that also has a merchant electricity market, which is a confusing hybrid that I'll try to untangle here in a bit. Well, PG&E, which serves, serves about, uh, about a third to 40% of the electricity in the state, I believe, well, they have had to deal with going through bankruptcies caused by liabilities from fires, and they've had to come out of it, okay? Well, I've seen people say, oh, 85% of the costs are from the fires. Well, hold up. 85% of the going forward increase above the already much higher than the rest of the U.S. and escalating faster than the U.S. costs are from that. And that's just the foreseen. That's what we can guarantee that much more expense from those fires, but that does not cover extra surprise costs like the fires in the first place. In other words, California set up a system where they were so focused on experimental goals, social and environmental goals that ultimately were experimental in nature and what they wanted to do to achieve them, that they lost focus on providing electricity reliably and cheaply, which was the original mission of regulating the utilities in the first place. Well, I, I'm just interested because uh, we're, we're making some comparisons in relative to the rest of the U.S., but it seems like there's a pretty um, significant degree of heterogeneity in terms of prices. Like, what are some of the states with the lowest electricity prices and, and how do they compare? I mean, you had a tweet recently as well, just looking at sort of the deindustrialization of Europe, the Spanish nuclear plant closures. Um, and how that's driving a lot of business from Europe over to the U.S. where they're seeking lower prices. Um, I'm guessing there's some states which are taking advantage of ultra low natural gas prices, maybe keeping some of their nuclear plants around and they've got very low prices. Um, just give us a sense, again, of, of like, the outliers. Sounds like California is the most expensive in the continental U.S. What's the cheapest? What, what are we talking about? And what are the implications? Sure. Of, of Let's have a session where we do a, a vocal version of a Vaslav Smil book where he spends an entire chapter just quoting numbers at you like, you, like he's writing, he's typing directly from an Excel spreadsheet. I, I think that his books are very important and they're also a severe abuse of readers. So although you've asked me to do this task, know that it gives me no pleasure. All right. Prices for electricity. <laughs> I'm going to talk about Illinois because I'm here in Chicago. I love Chicago. I love our nuclear system. And Illinois actually ends up being about the national average in everything, despite being cleaner than the national average, especially around Chicago with all our nuclear plants. So I'm going to speak in terms of dollars per megawatt hour. I'm also going to have a big asterisk right now because a bunch of uh, brain diseased 
electricity nerds are like, oh, that's energy information agency data. That you can't even rely on that. And then you ask them, well, is the real number higher than the EIA numbers or is it lower than the EIA numbers? And they'll say something like, oh, well, it's just very complicated. Okay, shut up. These are the numbers as reported by utilities and responsible parties around the United States and legally required monthly forms to electricity uh, information agents, energy information agency in DC. EIA then gathers up the numbers and publishes them to give a sense of where we are. Utilities are required to report. Um, load serving entities are required to, uh, there, there's some difference in who is required to give what kind of answers and what the EIA can do to force them to give answers. So these are not complete or um, 100% academically authoritative, but they're as good as we're going to get. And they serve for a very good launching point for discussion. Illinois numbers, I'm going to trust more than California numbers and for reasons we might get into later. But in Illinois, electricity costs on average for all sectors are about 11 or $12, uh, 110 to $120 per megawatt hour. Industrial electricity costs, that is electricity costs that are primarily generation and only a little bit transmission because these are bulk users of power typically all the time at a fairly steady rate with very simple grid connection issues. Not easy, but very simple grid connection issues where a giant user uses a giant amount of power from one plug-in spot on the grid. Industrial electricity rates are incredibly important to tease out from residential and commercial because they are the basis of a lot of other economic prosperity. Industrial electricity rates in Illinois are quite low. Uh, I believe 70 or, or about 70 or $80 a megawatt hour. It, residential rates in Illinois are something like $180 a megawatt hour, higher than I'd want, but uh, you know, not far from national average. So where does that leave us compared to California? In California, electricity, residential electricity rates are almost double. Industrial electricity, what <laughs> remaining industrial electricity is actually supplied in California is that part, this part really worries me, as high as residential electricity rates in Illinois and the rest of the USA. That is the expense of providing a little bit of power that goes all the way down through the most intricate part of the grid from the power plant to the transmission lines to the distribution lines where it splits up into all the little uh, wires that end up going into the neighborhoods, the apartment buildings, the houses, the individual units that are then monitored uh, for their usage and billed back to the customer. It's a much trickier procedure for utilities than the large industrial customers in terms of administration and the sheer number of miles of, of equipment to, and number of bits of individual equipment to repair. It's uh, almost artisanal electricity, shall we say. So we sh should expect it to be more expensive. Well, the fact that in Illinois, households get electricity at the same cost that a business would have to pay in California, this is an extreme case. That makes California, and I, I struggle to say this about any state in my beloved America, it makes California as bad as Europe. And if you knew just how stupid European leaders have been about energy for decades, just how dumb, how, how irresponsible, the fact that a state in the U.S. as large as California has done as badly as Europe, God, makes me, it really depresses me. Right. Boils your blood. I can see that. Uh, well, let's, let's turn oh, the focus sorry, back on California. I forgot to have, say what's uh, an extreme, uh, like, yeah, low <laughs> cost. A number of states in the U.S. are able to offer uh, industrial electricity at 50, 60 a megawatt hour, though I expect this to, uh, well, it's interesting. In the states with electricity markets, industrial electricity at that cost is going bye-bye. It is gone. It is done. You can no longer get large amounts of industrial electricity at, at prices in the 50s and 60s, as far as I know, in the United States. It's, I mean, I will be eager to have the haters come out and say, oh, Mark, you're a moron. I trade power every day and you can still do it. But I'm hearing that if you want large amounts of industrial electricity, you not only have to rush off in many ways to the market, so you can't there's not enough even in the regulated utility regions, which are the ones where, that are supposed to be able to plan out growing demand and providing the power. Um, I mean, those places are going to have 
put cases in front of their regulatory commission saying, we have all these businesses in order to say yes to them and grow the economy. We need your permission to build power plants. And during the building, we need to charge charge the, the cost to consumers and guarantee that you'll make sure we get our money back. That's the old world. That's the old American system. The new American system with the markets is one where if a business shows up to a power plant and says, hey, I see that you're selling all that power off to the grid. How about you stop and just sell it to me instead? I'll buy it right at your power plant. <laughs> well, this is the market region, baby. Right. That's what it was designed to do. And if they if they are going to pay, you can just cut off Chicago. You can cut off DC. You can cut off. It doesn't matter. They can go find electricity from the market, can't they? That's what the market is for. You can go invent a power plant from scratch in a few years in a volatile market, right? So if I'm a big consumer of electricity and I want power from, say, a nuclear plant and I don't give a damn about anything else and I have to have the power, I go to the market region and I buy up that nuclear industrial electricity. I can pay above those average rates that are, things are costing or maybe a little bit lo- below if I sign a long contract for a long time. And you can take that nuclear power that's been underappreciated straight off of the markets and just suck it in and, and make your AI super brain. That's, that's the new world. The old world is that you have to establish with the utilities and their regulators that doing that won't hurt the public too much or that you'll be able to serve that new load without taking kilowatts out of the mouth of babes, right? Kilowatt hours out of the, out of the orphanage in the market region. Well, guess what? The whole point is that if you have somebody who wants to buy more electricity, they can just move right in and buy it. And now we have that. So we're going to hear an amount of whining and crying that, that is just unprecedented from folks who previously would have defended the markets and their abuse of of nuclear plants as just the way of nature. Well, the way of nature is the snake turning back towards your babies, and now it's coming. It's going to swallow a bunch of them whole. So sorry about that rant. It's just it's emerging issue right now, and it helps frame the issue of, is California a regulated utility state? Mark, weren't you... Weren't you uh, talking about how this California Public Utilities Commission is is working with uh, PG&E, the utility, to decide how much power costs? Well, yes, but it's also a market region, which brings us to Californication of the grid, where you have arguably the worst of all worlds. You have a utility that is still providing an enormous amount of the essential services, including generation, but you also have a market that itself is mostly failing, but you also have the politics that are being executed by people who, until very recently, didn't seem to need to know anything about energy in order to control it or to be put in charge of passing along decisions from people who did know what they were talking about. Well, California seems to be a weird blend of all these issues. And in fact, there's an Antonio uh, Gramsci quote, the Italian communist quote that I like. It goes something like, uh, the old world is dying, yet the new world cannot be born. It is the time of monsters. Sorry if I've misquoted all my uh, commie listeners, but the, the sense of this is that we had a system that had provided a certain level of service for a really long time. A lot of that service was taken for granted as just what happens in advanced societies, and an effort was made to reform it or produce better outcomes than we are getting. The forces that came together to push for a alteration of the old system, which again is that a utility is given a monopoly over a region because electricity delivery is a physical system monopoly. That is, physically it is a monopoly, so institutionally a monopoly was was allowed over that system in an area. In return, there was a responsibility to provide power at levels set by regulators who themselves were either elected officials or appointed by elected officials. And then in return for providing the power fairly and justly and reasonably as negotiated between the utility and the the publicly appointed regulators, the utility was allowed to make a return on its capital above whatever rate you could get just sitting on bonds or, you know, sitting on uh, U.S. government debt, you could make a rate that was above that, often, you know, maybe uh, 50 to 100 percent more than you would make on those bonds, but less than the utility might attempt to need if they were not guaranteed those returns if they performed to the level set by their regulator. This is the 
cost of service model, the captive rate based model. What's funny to me is that upon breaking up this system, uh, a number of European countries are now struggling to build any type of power plant, and they're having to go back to thinking about what to them is an exotic system, a rate based model or a uh, regulated asset base model. And I'm like, yeah, that is how we built and still manage much of the USA today. And for them, it's like, there's this new system I need to tell you about. Have you heard of regulated asset base? And I'm like, yeah, it's still how we run the grid in um, the parts of America that tend to have really low uh, industrial electricity price. So California had the old system, what I just described. And then they said, let's, let's, do some invention. Let's experiment with it. This is going to be fun. Let's have an electricity market where eventually each person can decide what brand of electricity they want to buy from their supermarket, from their favorite energy company. You know, maybe they can make up their own energy company and buy and sell electricity for them and their friends. You know, if we have competition, what we do is that doesn't mean we have a second set of wires. In other words, you don't have a physical monopoly change. You still have a physical monopoly on the wires, but what you do is you force the people who still own the wires, let's say it's still the old utility, to accept onto those wires any power plant that meets certain requirements for safety or, um, you know, that if a power plant gets built, the people owning the wires have to transport it without bias or favor to their own power plants. Even better if those utilities are forced to sell all or most of their power plants in order to allow other people to try to operate the power plants better. The idea being is that now that you've induced a lot of competition, you have people competing to see who can drive the other gas-powered plant or coal-powered plant out of business fastest, then that will drive down costs once you uh, reduce the extra power plants that you don't need. The push To do this to a system that apparently worked and was powering modern growth came from a few places. One, let's say that big utilities were building a power plant type that you didn't like, like a nuclear system. If you break up nuclear, uh, if you want to break up nuclear, maybe the best way was to break up the control and the power of the entities that were building and funding nuclear. Here's another one. If you thought that the utilities were trying to make more money by building more power plants and getting a bigger pot of money, getting that steady 10% return, say, maybe you get a capped return, but if you grow the size of the pie that's spinning off little pieces of the pie, well, then that, in that case, the utility has uh, a reason to keep growing electricity. And if you are ideologically against electricity, if you're ideologically against energy and you want there to be less energy growth, or let's say you're okay with growth, but you hate waste and you see you want a less wasteful world where utilities are not incentivized to grow the pie, well, maybe if you break up the electricity sales business and make it to where it's a brutal business where people are competing against each other, well, then maybe there will be less growth. And so that's a reason to have electricity market. Also, here's another big one. And this one ends up being decisive in US history. If you have a bunch of cheap natural gas and you have a sudden supply of natural gas plants that are better technology than has ever existed in world history for converting fossil fuel to electricity, but you can't build any of them because there's already enough supply from crappy old plants, in your opinion or in reality, that are already there on the grid helping those big fat cat utilities just collect their slice of of returns then if you break up the system and you're able to make it a wild, wild west where the new plants can take a go at it, jump on the grid and displace the old plants, that is the new plants with a lower average cost of generating power than the old plants that had a higher cost and burn more fossil fuels or split more uranium, um, then what you can say is we make a market. The new capital will replace the new equipment. The good equipment will replace the old equipment. And if there are rewards that go to those new power plant owners for providing power at cheaper rates than the utility once provided, then those rents are are justified and the savings will pass along to consumers. That was the vision. And the natural gas being cheap led to pushes for deregulation, restructuring around the U.S. of the generation markets. And when the natural gas was expensive or, or the demand was temporarily supplied by a new wave of of expensive gas plants that needed to then collect rents, then the push for further deregulation or further restructuring was reduced. 
you, you're giving me uh, my new my new favorite sort of interviewing uh, uh, summary is to say you've given me a lot of threads to tug on here, Mark, and, and you sure have one of those ornate Persian rugs of yours. Um, but uh, you know, just to probably rewinding like a minute and a half back, I had this kind of like say Amory Lovins without saying Amory Lovins. Um, and it's been interesting talking with Noah Redberg recently and talking about the challenges of, of decarbonization and electrification. You know, he said in terms of process heat, what we have is a severe electricity shortage. And we were on this trajectory, I guess, with this big regulated uh, monopoly utility um, uh, behemoth of just adding more and more generation, which would have, again, suited us quite nicely now as we try and try to electrify or even as we have these emerging loads like, uh, you know, big baseload hungry um, AI uh, campuses, I think, as they're called. Which, um, by the um, way, I just have to say, just, just this is the eternal question. How much is too much? How much is enough? I'm now yes. more skeptical than ever of people who think they know exactly the right amount of energy to be provided. And therefore, they know that utilities shouldn't provide that much or shouldn't prepare to provide that much. I get really antsy when they say that we, we've built enough, let's just save from here on out. Because as we know from the history of industrial revolutions, if you invent a process that can have much more efficiently use energy, it's much more likely to blow up the energy use than to reduce it. Computation is more energy efficient than ever by, by orders of magnitude compared to in the past. And that doesn't mean we need less energy for it. It, needs, it means there's vastly more energy being demanded by it. So one answer is to say, no, that's a bad use of energy. We say no. Down Bitcoin, down. No, bad, bad, uh, bad viral growth of energy. Don't, don't be here. But on the other hand, at the point that you start deciding what are right and wrong uses of energy and saying no to a new industrial sectors, you end up having one of the most dangerous possibilities in the world becoming Europe, which is that you are <laughs> wrong about which industry should or should have been cut off or worse, you can't control everything. And in trying to reduce energy supply to new industries, you end up messing up energy supply to the old industries. That is basically what the, a lot of a lot of what's happening now in Europe is the idea was there's too much energy anyway. The problem is how to not have too much of it. Then suddenly you need to electrify for for clean steel or clean concrete or, or EVs or all these different things, but they've already severely damaged the competitiveness, the cost of their energy supply and the availability. And then it's a little too late to immediately reform every aspect of how you think and regulate energy and how your industries work. It's a little too late and you got it wrong. It turns out electricity is needed for all these other goals that come from environmentalism, the climate uh, change goals. The, and it's very, very uh, late, a lot of environmentalists have now realized electricity substitutes beautifully for a lot of other things done more in a more dirty fashion, which you said you wanted me to say Amory Lovins. I would say to the listeners, go listen to our Amory Lovins episode. He advocated against big grids, efficiently providing a little bit of extremely pure, high-grade, uh, controllable energy that we call electricity to homes and to businesses. He was against that. He thought you instead should build, burn a little bit of fossil fuels at your home or run a little wind turbine or something like that. He was wrong. His organization has had to pivot around to promoting large grids, pumping green energy into the cities. They, they got it right, but the, because the Institute was founded to advocate against that because it enabled putting all these loads and all this demand together and building a nuclear plant to serve it and a big grid to take the power straight to the city because Rocky Mountain Institute and the Amory Lovins mindset was against that. They were extremely late to have to pivot to electricity and supergrids actually being a good thing. So, so Mark, I think you've given us a pretty good uh, overview of, of sort of the market and, and policy structures that have, have led to this. You know me, I like to get out of abstractions and more into sort of granularity, uh, things I can touch and feel. Um, so let's talk a little bit more, coming back with our focus on California to sort of how that has played out, uh, you know, particularly interested in, again, these turns against what feel like Californian political class instincts. Can um, we talk solar? You know, whether they were forced kicking and screaming. Well, I mean, let's talk about, again, this, 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 the saving of the Diablo Canyon power plant, how a governor who um, was 
having a strong path dependency where closing it sort of was forced kicking and screaming perhaps although that happened off off screen uh into reversing that you know how it was almost uh uh you know a a it was certainly a clear majority i think it was almost unanimous that that vote to save the plant so that goes against some of the kind of political class instincts also this reversal of uh, rooftop solar subsidies or, or a, a decreasing of that subsidy that sort of goes against I feel like the kind of DNA of the of the California political class so they're being forced into doing some of these things why what what were the policies that got us there and then and and why why are we seeing these things which are to me as an outside observer quite quite surprising I mean it, it seems obvious why they need to happen but that's that's quite a phenomenon at least for me to I love linking to, California and Germany so <laughs> let's let's come up with a new term inverse Merkel Merkel to the power of negative one. To me, um, <laughs> Gavin Newsom is sort of an inverse Merkel. Merkel came into power in Germany thinking, okay, nuclear is okay. I, I um, think that nuclear is probably necessary. Uh, a bunch of people on the other parties don't like nuclear, but my party likes nuclear, so I'm going to like nuclear, um, and we're going to push back the phase out. So that was what, 2010 or so. Then Fukushima Daiichi happened. An event happens. And Merkel turns all the way against nuclear, or at least in terms of policy, regardless of whether she herself had any personal fear. The important thing was to do what was the middle ground to be almost exactly the middle line of politics. And she was very successful. She was almost an apolitical leader in some ways, depending on which German you talk to. And she steered this middle course where no election was ever in doubt when she was there. She was just the middle line of Germany for a very long time. I saw articles near the end of her tenure saying how Merkel killed democracy by being so perfectly the obvious choice that, so centrist. that there was no almost no need right. to vote anymore. In a, in a coalition, there was yeah, almost nobody in, in a government based upon to, coalitions. To take her mantle because she was so yeah. the middle. So in Gavin Newsom's case, he was anti-nuclear, but by all accounts, he's not afraid of nuclear. He's just trying to do exactly the middle line of what Californians think should happen. So on nuclear, he was a helping arrange the destruction of Diablo Canyon because in his point of view, it would be bad if Diablo Canyon closed instantly. So he didn't want a chaotic close, but he did want to help get it closed to be able to show Californians that he could execute their political will, that he could get things done. And if Californians in their infinite wisdom and genius wanted nuclear gone, then he would help deliver a nuclear free state after the closure of San Onofre. This takes us back to 2015, 16. So Gavin gets meetings with PG&E and says, hey, I have the ability to destroy your plant because I'm a vote on the uh, land, you know, the, 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 uh, I think it's the Lands Commission that three votes, one of which is the Lieutenant Governor of California, the other two are kind of, no offense to whoever they are, probably kind of non-entities, and the Lieutenant Governor is the one plugged in with the state, uh, you know, democratic system fully, and therefore kind of has the power here. So Gavin Newsom has the ability to, if he wants, help destroy Diablo Canyon immediately by denying the ability to intake water that's required to cool the plant but he's saying no let's be reasonable let's do a you know a, a planned closure of old nuclear because we're moving forward california wants to move forward so let's work this out so then um an agreement was made they found some unions who didn't care about diablo and got them to say jump on the agreement because then it's union backed right um even though it's not the unions that have the most to lose from this and the unions were told you know, it'll be so devastating to a uh, state energy system that we're going to give you so many jobs trying desperately to make up for the loss of our last large reliable right. power plant. So it'll be amazing, uh, union. So you guys should just go along with it and show we have union backing for this ecumenical deal that brings together the uh, conservation groups, which I hope weren't taking Russian money, but we're going to have to wait to find that out. And then everybody comes together, kumbaya moment, PG&E has an internal war between the natural gas guys and the electricity guys. The natural gas guys are like, look, we can make so much money on natural gas shutting down the nuclear plant. Let's just do it. And then the people in the finance department are like, why are we bothering to run this nuclear plant? We are not allowed to make profits on it, yet it remains a risk on our balance sheet. Why? Well, it goes back to that old world dying, new world can't be born monsters. Diablo Canyon was plucked out of the set of power plants that PG&E was supposed to sell out to, you know, Enron and other people like that. PG&E was left burdened with it. But then when power prices went up and it was making hundreds of millions of dollars for PG&E, 
the state then says, no, that's not fair. You're not allowed to make money. It's supposed to be a bad thing that nuclear exists. So let's take your profit. So Diablo Canyon was carved out as a, as a plant that was like run like a regulated asset based utility plant, but without the ability for PG&E to really make a bunch of money on it. So it was just a risk of, say, bankrupting PG&E if something went wrong or there's an earthquake or a meltdown or something. So PG&E itself was divided against its crown jewel generating asset, the most important power plant on the coast of, of, of North America. They were not allowed uh, to really think about that broader picture. PG&E leaders in 2015 needed to go along with the lieutenant governor and the environmentalists and the unions and shut down, agree to shut down their plant, but in an orderly fashion by 2024, 2025, because in that time you could build a bunch of solar plants that although they went off at night and they're located hundreds of miles through wildfire territory away from the coast where the power is needed, it's all fungible because no one actually has to know about energy because energy is easy. Leave it for the nerds. We're politicians with beautiful political goals. Just, just PG&E, sit down, we're going to talk this through and we're going to dig your grave carefully with you participating with a part of the shovel. We're going to give you a golden shovel to dig your grave with. And then we're going to squeeze your neck softly and put you in it, um, uh, or at least your nuclear division. And then California will move towards a glorious future. That was 2015. That was the equivalent, um, like I said, inverse Merkel. That was like uh, the zero events moving forward with the standard California elites and even the public view of what should happen to nuclear in the state. Okay. Then events happen. Now there was a big campaign to save the plant, which is why we were ready when events happened with the right message and with the right cogs already rolling, but events happened. Those events included a little blackout from giant wildfires uh, just a little black, and it wasn't big. It wasn't like Texas size, for God's sake. It was just a, a wee little California style blackout. But suddenly, Gavin Newsom's brain it it altered his thinking as much as Fukushima Daiichi altered Merkel's away from what had been the central apolitical California direction into the new world where your very survival as a political leader, the rest of your career, is going to be defined by blackouts if you let it happen. And it caused him to get very serious about energy. Uh, I thought Europe would be getting serious about energy because of the uh, war in Ukraine and the blow up of Nord Stream, but they still don't get it. I think they're just a little, a little slow in the old world. But in the new world, we're quick. That's American dynamism for you. Gavin Newsom was never scared of nuclear. He just was going along with the closure and helped make it happen. When the order comes down that, you know, from Newsom, do whatever it takes to not let there be blackouts again, one of the most important pieces of that is keeping Diablo Canyon. Why? Because Diablo Canyon is not, it's, it's not located in a wildfire region. The power lines are not going through forest in the foothills of the Sierras. Um, there's no heat wave that can knock Diablo offline. It's by the cool ocean, sucks in the ocean water, puts it back, and, it, and, it, and its operation factor is higher than the builders of Diablo ever could have imagined. Why is that? Well, back when the regulated utility world was the only world that anybody knew in America, PG&E had made a argument for building Diablo Canyon that included hopefully getting to 75% operating capacity factor at the plant. And the finances of the plant were based on not spending as much as they did to build it. So that blew up. But on the other side, it's not 75% that they operate at. It's down to like 90, it's 93, 94, 95% when Siemens uh, generator parts aren't messing up, you know? So what does this mean? It means German that sabotage. as much as it costs to build the Alba Canyon, it's now the crown jewel asset of the state's electricity system as a whole. And the removal of it, which we were just going through zombie style, California center of the line, the governor decided, no, we have to keep it. A bunch of other things had to happen to make it possible. Um, he was able to, everybody was able to like blame Everybody is able to blame PG&E for almost everything forever. Part of the role of PG&E remaining a regulated utility, vertically integrated utility with a, with a ratepayer base in California is to observe all the shit that rolls downhill. PG&E's job is to sit there and just take infinite amounts of abuse. Did you know that PG&E is a criminal organization? Like the entire thing is in jail. Like the entire thing is a criminal. They had to sign an agreement that said, we are a criminal corporation. You know, a corporation is like a legal body, right? Well, it is a criminal legal bottle. PG&E is evil and criminal. Now, 
Did they do things wrong with the wildfires? Yes, there was tree trimming that they had received money to do, had said they had done and had not gotten done. But on the other hand, I have an enormous amount of sympathy for them because the amount of tree trimming that they really needed to do to stop wildfire risk was vastly more than Californians had an appetite to allow, that that the regulators at the California Public Utility Commission did not have the stomach, as far as we can tell, to allow PG&E to cut that many lines. All of this, I know you asked about Diablo. What all of this means is reality has set in just in time for that nuclear plant. It was not in time for San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, which in many ways to me triggered a lot of the death spiral we're seeing now, where a plant that produced what? Something like 10% of the state's power um, and did it extremely cheaply, exactly where it's most needed and most irreplaceable in the population centers of around San Diego and Los Angeles, where there's a huge amount of demand. You're not moving those cities. Just because there's mountains blocking transmission coming in does not mean you're going to take San Francisco or San and Los Angeles and San Diego and move them over the mountains into the desert so they can be powered all day by solar power and all night by YOLO energy. No, no, you're not going to move those cities. You're going to keep it right there, right there, powered by whatever is along the beach for much of the hours of the day. And that happened to be either oil burners, gas generators, or San Onofre nuclear generating station. San Onofre was closed. I've had the, in Dubai at breakfast at a hotel, James Krellenstein and I almost came to blows over the issue of San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. I can feel him possibly looking over and breathing down my neck and demanding to go on to a special issue of, of fighting with Mark on Decouple Podcast. So we need to avoid being a, you know, a daytime soap opera here. But James and I came to, almost came to blows over this. He says the nuclear industry messed up. The uh, the San Onofre nuclear generating station was mismanaged. The parts were of poor quality coming in from Mitsubishi in Japan, and the whole thing was bungled. And so that's what caused San Onofre to get closed. And I said, no, the patient was on life support, and Californians came in, unplugged the life support as as the as the signs of life were coming in, the brainstem was starting to wake up. They yank it and they strangle the patient and said, "Why would the nuclear industry do this? Why would the, you know?" They came in as the doctors were assessing that the patient could recover. They got out a gun out of their white lab coat. You tell me if this is your procedure, and they just shot the patient to death and said, "Why would the patient be? Uh, you know, it's 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 just a victim of of uh, the nuclear industry." No. San Onofre could have been saved, the parts could have been replaced, and there was nothing that could replace power of that quality or cost in California on that part of the grid. When that was lost, there was nothing to bring power anywhere near that cost ever again, and there may never will be. That plant should be running at $30 to $40 a megawatt hour in perpetuity. So I mentioned that the retail rates in Illinois were like about $11 or $12, $110 or $112 a megawatt hour. California rates are now up above $23, $24, $25 a megawatt hour with residential rates soaring higher than that. What this means is your electricity bill is made up of the cost of producing the power, the cost of sending the power on the big lines, the cost of delivering power to your house, to your business on the small lines, the cost to administer the whole system, right? Or And the cost of crazy things like wildfires if somebody has to pay for it and it ends up on your bill. Right. So that's your electricity bill. Somehow all of that money has to add up to the cost of the system, along with the losses of the of people who have invested money in to build the system. So the generation traditionally generation. Sorry, I'm still going here. The generation cost was traditionally about approximately half of the cost of delivering electricity broadly for an industrial consumer the generation cost should be a bigger portion for a commercial and uh, and, uh, residential household consumer. The cost of generation is a smaller portion. One of the things that drives me nuts when people say, oh, solar and wind are very cheap. Okay, they might be cheap in terms of one particular way of short-term accounting in the generation side. What does it do to the rest of your bill? If you have cheap generation that explodes the rest of your bill, while not removing the need for a bunch of the remaining 
now much more expensive remaining generation, then your bills can explode geometrically. They can, they can shoot upwards. And that's basically the story in, the, in California. San Onofre would have been a, you know, a reasonable chunk of a reasonable amount of cost for, for generation. It was lost. The substitute for it is much more expensive than the additional sometimes on, sometimes off in Shala generation from the wind farms and the solar panels. That's going to come and mix in. It's not going to displace as much of that now more expensive generation than you thought, but it will explode the other components of your bill. So what we have in California is that they've spent something like $110 billion in nominal, nominal dollars on solar. That's not the replacement cost. I have to be clear here. If you wanted to replace every single one of those panels, the cost would be significantly less than $110 billion. For one, the projects are already there. For uh, second, the grid is already there if the, if the projects are on and working. Three, panels are now ultra dirt cheap. And because ESG or regulatory or uh, environmental and social and governance criteria for clean energy never really had to consider where those panels are coming from. It could come from anywhere and it didn't matter didn't matter. It means that the the power, the panels you can get for replacement, if, especially if you disregard ESG stuff, can be dirt cheap. So, But that doesn't mean that that $110 billion wasn't already spent in California. A bunch of that money was by the, regu- the remaining regulated utilities. Why? Because the market players wouldn't build solar when it was too expensive. So the state forced the utilities to do it and say, put it on, a, put it on their tab. Yeah? So California was a solar pioneer at the cost of an immense amount of legacy cost rolled into consumer bills that then provided this big fat base of high cost that when costs started exploding upwards, you're doing it from a high altitude. It's like uh, ascending into the death zone on Mount Everest. It's not that Mount Everest is the biggest mountain on earth. It's pretty good size, but it's from a high altitude base. It's from a base that would feel exhausting to almost any normal person just to be at the base. And then you're going up into the death zone from there. What we're seeing in electricity in California is that they were starting at Everest electricity base camp and then ascending straight into the death zone. With and I can't see any reason why we should expect those costs to fall much in the future. Even if replacing all that solar is cheaper in the future, you're still having to now replace a bunch of solar that didn't last as long as legacy generation. Now, if legacy generation like natural gas was burning suddenly expensive natural gas, then it, we might have a situation where legacy solar does lead to some kind of lower cost in the future, but those costs are just the generation costs that are now a small bit of customer bills, right? The rest of the costs of administering the grid and dealing with the profound effects of extremely high prices for an extremely long time, you're going to have to spend more to attempt to save more. And it's not clear if that ever ends with cheaper electricity bills in the future. So I'm glad we're getting uh, into the solar side of things, but imports are also a major part of the Californian story. Can you, can you walk into a little bit of that and maybe a little bit more on the rooftop solar side of things as well? I think you've been describing utility grade solar off in the deserts, transmitting power over mountains and through forests and, and the implications that's had. I mean, this has been, <laughs> I've been trying to interrupt, but I've been glad that I've, I've been prevented to because this has been a, a really uh, illuminating no uh, pun intended. episode so far for me. So yeah, tie in, tie in imports. Absolutely. Tie, tie in imports and, uh, and tie in the rooftop. Okay. So in order to answer your question, we have to go back to the beginning of history. No, just kidding. But uh, California really was a pioneer in <laughs> electricity, so-called white gold is can you guess what white gold described if black gold is is oil what is white gold oh man i mean solar lithium nah uh, it's hydro hydro uh, well, okay we we called it we called it white we called it white coal my ancestor thomas coltrane Kiefer said we could be uh uh you know freed from our shackles of bondage to pennsylvania coal by developing our the white coal of our falling water. Well, so, so the white that. gold Go from ahead. the Sierra Nevadas, as opposed to the the gold gold. Well, maybe this was because you were that was in areas yes. that weren't also producing gold in the same spot. So yes. white gold was exactly. making dams high in the Sierras, and really California helped pioneer the technology of long distance transmission of electricity because mm, you had fuel starved area along the coast, not a lot to burn. Everything has to be shipped in pretty much or shipped over once the railroad came in. 
Um, and then you have the electricity up in the Sierra Nevadas. You build the dam, you send it down. Pacific Gas and Electric is one of the grand old dames of the entire world of electricity, along with ComEd or Electricity de France, right? So PG&E helped pioneer this world. They brought power down from the Sierras. California would have been a center of power generation and consumption. But from uh, before the Enron era, electricity has had to be imported to California to meet demand. In fact, California would have been severely constrained in its growth if they couldn't send down huge amounts of hydro from the north through the large hydro projects uh, along the rivers that helped power the Manhattan Project um, in World War II. Those big dams helped send power down to California. And then from across the west, coal plants and now solar plants and wind, even wind facilities, help provide power to California, natural gas plants, and even nuclear. The formerly largest nuclear plant in the United States as of a few days ago, or, uh, you know, it's now second place as of a few days ago, is Palo Verde Nuclear Generating Station. A third of Palo Verde's power, or about one reactor out of the three reactors in the deserts around uh, Phoenix, is dedicated to providing electricity over the power lines into Southern California. So how much of this? This is about, it's been running about 20% of California's demand is served from out of state. So what happens when California now saturates the grid day after day for a lot of the year with its solar and then sometimes wind production? What happens? Well, that power now flows in the reverse direction on the lines. Only trouble with this is if other states have similar energy plans and similar energy goals, you're going to get an inability to geographically adjust. I mean, if you have an immense problem with California losing generating capacity from solar as the sun sets. Arizona isn't going to help you. Nevada is not there for you. And Oregon and Washington were never there for you in the first place. So what you have is too much similarity between California's goals and what would happen if the states around California followed California's plan. There are coal plants in those states that are turning off and that's a win because it means less coal power flowing into California, messing up their books. I have to give a shout out to California's rigor in counting carbon emissions from out of state in its electricity grid as part of the uh, part of its own budget. Now, it's not it's not purely motivated. This means an immense amount of uh, money that can be spent if it's available. If you can find it, you can spend an immense amount of money cleaning up the out of state coal by building an enormous amount of uh, infrastructure that's cleaner in California, batteries to store more of that solar in the, in the noontime, um, batteries to store more of the wind, even when it's blowing everywhere. You know, if you can count all the carbon from out of the state, you can figure out a reason why there's a new energy uh, community, energy investment community in California that'll grow up to answer that demand of stopping that coal from out of state. But what this means is California is dependent on exports that are going to be possibly less reliable imports from other states, exports from those states that are possibly less reliable in the future. Mark, I'm, I'm absolutely loving the kind of geography of energy that you're painting here with California. I had the privilege of attending the Breakthrough Dialogues a couple of times, and uh, Dylan and I rented a car and went up to uh, Yosemite. And so I have a sense, and I was in LA recently, I have a sense of the geography and and the coast and the Sierras and the desert on the other side and mapping out how, how California's energy history has played out is just fascinating with that very basic understanding. But yeah, so along the coast, basically, not any big fossil fuel reserves. Well, hold um, up, hold up. They had nuclear um, plants. We found them. <laughs> La Brea par tar pits. There's, yeah. there's uh, California was one of the great oil okay. producing states. There will be blood, had it which all. gave both yeah. of us our mustaches, right? There will be blood with Daniel Day Lewis. That is set in California. That's about building an oil pipeline from the oil fields of, of Southern California over the mountains and through the woods and, and down to the coast where the demand was. So careful. There's We did find fossil fuels. It's just later and oil is not an amazing thing to make electricity out of unless you've messed up your energy policy so badly that you're forced to. <laughs> 
in any case, yeah, this this uh, the kind of the way that this energy policy uh, maps onto and is informed by geography appeals to the geographic determinist in me, the, the Jared Diamond lover, the uh, prisoners of geography, the Daniel Jurgen uh, inspired parts of me. But can so we I'm, mention I'm the rule that, that was used to kill off the nuclear plants to argue that the nuclear plants had to go? Please, well, please, nuclear yeah. plants and other heat using power plants, coal, gas, oil, whatever, need water to cool off, I mean, typically water, you can use air, but it's really inefficient. They need water, they need something to cool off the system so that they can get a lot of power out. We're not gonna have our entropy episode here, but just just trust me out there. You need to cool things off to make things powerful, right? The more you can cool, the more powerful you can make things, right? So where do you get as much water as you want that no one else is using? The coast. Well, no one else, starfish might use it, Um, depending on how much you take, fish might use it, might mess up tide pools. So if you want a strictly pure environment untouched by man, you can just ban power plants from taking in water from the coast. Easy. Especially useful if the main plants with no alternatives are nuclear. So if you see that the only plants left in California, only nuclear plants left in California are along the coast, you can take the principle that maybe it would be better not to suck in water and put it back a little, a few degrees warmer. And you say, oh, let's just have a sweet, innocent little world. Just like no more coastline work. No more, no more taking in water on the coastline. And suddenly that becomes a death sentence for all the power plants. Now, here's what PG&E said. This is the battle that led to the intervention from the Lieutenant governor that helped bring about the agreement with the environmental groups and the unions to close the plant. Ah. Um, Anyway, these were the arguments that led up to this. While PG&E was still trying to defend itself and the future of California by defending Diablo, they were saying, oh, that impact rule about the coastline, we can meet the standards. First of all, we're not hurting the coast, so that's good. That's good to know that you have a rule that's supposed to improve a situation that itself is not bad. So we're going to argue that that's a little weird. Second, let's do some mitigation. Let's make you a new artificial reef and all these crabs and fish will play and sharks will come and brutally eat the fish. It'll be nature. It'll be amazing. Should cost a few, a, like 10 million, 15 million. Maybe if you force us 40 million and we'll put it on people's tabs. Easy. So then the state regulators are like, no, 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 you don't get it. We're not trying to mitigate things. We're trying to kill you. You're supposed to die. <laughs> you know, it's, it's Diablo Canyon saying, you expect me to mitigate. And then the regulator saying, no, we expect you to die. So Diablo Canyon <laughs> didn't get the hint. PG&E didn't get the hint. They're like, we can protect the environment. And then the people using the environmental laws are like, do you really think that that's why we use environmental laws to protect the environment? No, if we, you know, this is to kill you. So then they argued to PG&E, you need to actually not, not take any water in. So then PG&E said, but then we'd need to build cooling towers on the, on the, like a, the coast on like this cramped little spot. We need the to build coast, cooling yeah, towers. Yeah. And then the regulators were like, oh, no, we didn't, you know, this isn't, that's not the reason we're trying to do you dirty. We want you dead, not building cooling towers. So then after the agreement was made, the solution was claiming that the cooling towers would cost about double the cost of having built the plant in the first place. That is uh, uh, cooling towers with essentially no moving parts, just a cone of concrete where you can, you can build it in like three months or whatever. You just make a cooling tower, right? Right there. Oh, no, we need some seismic seismic structuring, whatever. PG&E then, once the hit was in, once the once the knife was in and like, it was all good, PG&E then, had, then claimed the reason we may have to shut down the plant is because cooling towers are going to cost like 10 billion. Now, there was some subtleties in here. First, if you claim cooling towers cost 10 billion, that's a reason it's not reasonable to force you to build them and you should be allowed to do the reefs. At the point that you've, deci- you've decided it's best to die, claiming, oh, we have to build cooling towers and they cost 10 billion because that's just how much a cooling tower should cost, right? Then it's a reason for everybody to see, see, that's why PG&E decided it was in the economic best interest of everybody to close the plant. Isn't it great? We have this issue in Spain now where it's like, stop hitting yourself, you know, quit, quit punching yourself in the face, you dumb utility. In Spain, people responded to my visit by saying, no, no, the utilities themselves are the ones that have decided to close the plant. Yes, because they're being held hostage by your politicians who could kill them at any moment with with dirtier laws. Now, let me sum up this whole coastline story with Diablo Canyon, and it really summarizes California in a way. 
Because what about the gas plants? What about the oil plants? Yeah, they're but they're necessary. <laughs> for their cooling water intakes? Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, you forgot, I forgot Chris. Mark, sorry. They're necessary, <laughs> right? Question. Okay. So in the, in the nuclear plants, and by the way, this was used as an argument for no sense trying to repair power plants if you're going to have to shut off because of coastal rules anyway. And within PG&E, within, San, right. within uh, SC, uh, California, San Diego, uh, Gas Electric, uh, or Southern Cal Edison that was the owner of songs, the argument would go, they're just going to screw us anyway. We are on limited time unless we can convert California's politics to be pro-nuclear. We might as well not fight on the nuclear plant. Like that was, it was seriously corrosive, these rules. At the point that Ga Governor Newsom decided to save the plants, the argument given for why you could save the plants is that the environment around them was fine, so they get a waiver of the uh, coastline rule with no modifications, no artificial reef necessary. <laughs> why? Because the environment was already fine. That was the 2022 argument, whereas the whole point of like forcing them to close in the first place was that you had to improve the little like coastal zone 10 meters off of where the plant is. And then the reason given for saving it was, oh yeah, we have an environmental rule, but that's to protect the environment. And the environment isn't hurt by this plant now that we realize we have to have it or we're screwed. It just sums up so much about California. I mean, they have not yet truly gotten here on, on housing policy and all sorts of other policies. They're on their way, I think. I have faith in California, more than people might think, considering how much I rant about it and how much it traumatized me and my family. But uh, that faith is tempered by the knowledge of how much pain there is left to go just on the policies that were already implemented. There's a path dependency here that is going to be really rough. Net energy metering with solar and the solar issue in general is really about this. I said 110 billion for solar. Well, that was just... That's a that's a, like a lump sum. I mean, that's not a flow of money, though that money has to be flowing back to the people who did that or they'll go bankrupt from their investments. The bigger issue I have is that this net energy metering is when people spent money or financed, you know, solar panels on their house and then were given many times more than the value of that power onto their electricity bills, dumping the need to pay for the system onto everybody else. Now that net energy metering is is being changed and just mark just for a sec because we've shifted over to rooftop solar now from from the coastal stuff just want to kind of note that as a new chapter but yeah just just for the novices out there uh, myself kind of included just uh, the net energy metering just sure to find that so slightly we that. the grid californication of the grid is the title of this episode the grid is the power plants the power lines the thick juicy power lines that bring the big power out from the power plants the smaller lines that, uh, that, that distribute, the distribution lines that take the transmission line power from the generators and send it to the public, and then the administrative structure to take care of all of that. That is the grid in my definition. I've had grid nerds say, that's not the grid. The grid is X or Y or just the lines or just the transmission. No, the grid is everything. The culture has one. Yeah. Grid means everything. Everything is now the grid. Power plants, transmission, distribution. Yeah. So what people were doing were getting solar on their roof. It's sensible, right? R rather than bring power from a distant power plant, which Amory Lovin's uh, energy whiz kid said was bad, even though losses are like, what, five, 6% to do that. It's just not bad. He said, put the energy you need right at your house so you can generate what you use. So if you put solar on your roof and you, if you're a rich California that has a house with a roof and a lot of money for solar panels, you can build enough solar panels to, on average cover your energy demands over the year, especially if you don't have an electric car or you haven't electrified everything else and you still have that juicy natural gas hookup. So you have solar on your roof. How much should you get paid for doing your own energy? Now, you're not disconnecting from the grid. I have no problem. If people disconnect from the grid, go for it. Cut that wire. Get out a big pair of shears and just chop that shit off, right? Disconnect from the grid. Make your own energy. Be a homesteader right there in, in the promised land of coastal California. But most people don't because uh, they just something, they just don't, right? So they have their solar on the roof. On average, it covers a bunch of their demand, but it happens to cover their demand when the value of covering their own demand with their solar is zero. Why? Because their neighbor is doing it. Because the solar farms out in Arizona and, and, and uh, deserts of California are making buku power that's already being paid for at extreme rates, hundreds per megawatt hour, depending on how old the plant is. 
that's what those plants were guaranteed by the state in order to get them built, the pioneering solar. So if you get credited a price for solar that's extreme and doesn't represent the cost of providing electricity service the rest of the hours, there's losses. What net energy metering means was there was just a convention, not a law, not a, just a convention where what will just give people, because it's a small amount of solar, who even cares? Let's just take the amount of power they produce at retail rate. So that is the price once you include the entire grid, not just the generation, not just the solar out in the desert, but take all the costs of administrating the grid, average it out per unit of power and say, let's give them that discount per unit of power they make. That is instead of wholesale costs, which now are a small percentage of California's energy costs, something like, I don't know, 25%, I believe of, of California electricity costs for uh, residential consumers approximately about a quarter is going to be that generation. Let's just hand the entire stack four times that value to them for every unit of electricity they make, no matter when they make it. When you include the market effects here, and what's the market price of wholesale generation at the time that people's rooftop solar provides them with power, you're getting into times where we're curtailing power all over the state that has to be paid for by somebody. And then you're telling a rooftop person whose power is literally not needed, not wanted at that time, that that counts for as much as the average cost to deliver power, including all the dark hours, all the heat heat uh, wave hours, all the times when energy demand is high, but the sun went down. We're giving people credit during their worthless hours for the average total cost and, of generating. And how many, how many cents? Hours. And how many cents per kilowatt hour um, well, are they getting paid? Like, California's dumping electricity, maybe if, selling at negative. California electricity right. costs exported. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's negative pricing, exports. So, yeah. Okay. So what are, what are we looking at comparisons? We're curtailing. Your we're, residential we're, energy rate last year might have been $30, $300 a megawatt hour. And if, if your listeners hear me keep stumbling over that, it's because I keep thinking of in cents, 30 cents per kilowatt hour is $300 per megawatt hour. Kilowatt hour. I'm going to yeah. stick with megawatt hours because I think that that's a more – understandable convention now with the the big units we're seeing today. So $300 a megawatt hour, that is your average cost of your entire bill, including the cost to generate power, the cost to transmit it to you, distribute to you, and administer the whole thing and clean up from the wildfires and all that other stuff. Okay. So, so 30, cent, 30 cents a kilowatt hour, just do both just hour, for the sake of the out there like me. So okay. if you gotcha. produce a few megawatt hours of solar, you were being given $300 a megawatt hour back for that solar. A California house may use uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 megawatt hours of electricity per year. So if you spend $30,000 on a solar panel because you're going to totally make back um, thousands of dollars in value uh, per year, then it pays itself off in four or five years maybe. But if the value of this service that you're replacing from the grid is actually only a few cents per kilowatt hour or a few tens of dollars per megawatt hour, then you're being given four times that value, five times, 10 times that value, depending on the location and the severity of, of this, this uh, residential electricity price growth in the future. Who pays that? You're like, oh, the big bad utility is going to get it in the pants. Ha, huh? I'm going to induce losses. Well, the thing is, your solar panels aren't necessary, but the utility is or something like the utility. So if it's between politicians being told the utility will literally go bankrupt or destroy every poor person in your state by charging the cost of the rich people's solar to the poor people, or you can just tell the rich people the deal is canceled, screw that, we're going backwards, we just can't afford it, they're going to have to bend the knee and force the people with solar panels not to get a free ride anymore. The amount of teeth gnashing about this is incredible. Not not just a free not just a free ride, but to get quite an expensive. Well, Pinto, depending on right? how you're Uber, looking at it, whatever if you had an Uber ideal Deluxe. academically approved system where people's solar panels were exactly crediting them, if you could even calculate this, exactly crediting them with the avoided costs of each part of the grid that would have to be enlargified or whatever to handle the houses in the area if they didn't have solar a few hours a day or whatever. If you could exactly quantify that, the, the thinking is maybe we could not be so harsh and there'd be some middle ground, but it's very difficult technologically. It's difficult economic. It's very difficult to administer this, which means it's opaque uh, to policymakers and they need to just fall back onto easier things like no more net energy metering free rides. Then you get all sorts of disgusting stuff like 
Net energy meeting was awful for poor people. But then you had groups claiming to represent, I don't know, energy justice or whatever that were being paid by solar lobby to say, oh, you're going to hurt energy justice if you take away our giant subsidies for Californians who own roofs. So so just let me let me make sure that I understand this. So um, these homes are getting paid retail rates around 30 cents a kilowatt hour oh, no, 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 no. for whatever they produce. At, at a, no, no, but, but let me just finish. Let me just, like, you tell me what I'm wrong on. At a time in which California is overproducing solar, maybe having to dump it or sell it at negative prices abro- uh, you know, across state lines or whatever. The value of the solar has gone down to zero or even less than solar, but folks with rooftop solar through net energy metering are being paid. Is it 30 cents a kilowatt hour? Because that's, that's a ton of money. And anyway, if you could get 30 cents a kilowatt hour, $300 a megawatt hour in the year of our Lord 2024 for your residential electricity rate in coastal California, you're doing great. I'm hearing people talk about $400, $500, sometimes peak prices $600 per megawatt hour, which makes it again, and I shudder to say this, I can't believe I'm saying this about a part of America worse than Germany. I know, right? To think that we could have in our country (laughs) an energy policy so broken that it's as bad as the Germans is unspeakable. It makes me want to puke. Yeah, yeah. No, but otherwise, you basically had it right. And and German policy. You were being paid for what is replacing an aspect of wholesale power and a little bit of the transmission and distribution, a bit because you still need that or you would have disconnected from the grid. You're replacing a bit of that but being credited with the value of all of that and all on averages that don't represent the timing aspect of this electricity generation. If anything, you're being a little bit undercredited with the location aspect, a little bit, tiny bit, but you're being radically overcredited with the location aspect or with the uh, timing aspect, which in turn, if you look at the markets, which again, I hate, but whatever, they're there, the markets that represent the value to the grid of wholesale electricity at a certain time and at a certain place, you're being radically overcompensated. The removing of an under subsidy feels like an attack. It feels like an assault. The removal of a privilege is one of the most painful things that a human can experience in any context. And that is what is being experienced in California. The reason that politicians are holding the line is because the alternative is awful. The alternative is catastrophic, which is the collapse of the utilities. And then the politicians would really be, they would have everything they ever wanted, control over power. They just wouldn't like it and they would find they have to learn about it and they're not good at it. Okay, so we, I think there's one final thing we need to cover. We've, we've gone through sort of the market structures. We've talked about uh, nuclear and the kind of coastal politics. We've talked about solar. We've talked about imports. We haven't talked about another cost that's being disguised here, which is the behind the meter cost. So I imagine industrial users, and we had this great interview with David March recently of Exergy Energy um, on power quality, um, and a, a number of users, I imagine the remaining industrial users that are still in California are installing backup generators, either to deal with power quality issues or actually just try and produce cheaper on-site power generation than what they can buy from the grid when the markets are going crazy and prices are skyrocketing when the sun goes down and natural gas peakers take off. So. To what degree is that what I tend to call like the Nigerification of the grid, um, what Amory Levins might like to talk about as kind of like a nice decentralized picture. But in order to get that reliable juice to mission critical, uh, you know, manufacturers or other industrial or hospitals, uh, they, they need some backup on site now in a way they didn't before because the grid used to be reliable. So talk a little bit about those sort of hidden costs that are not even reflected in these outrageous uh, commercial industrial. So, it, of course, rates. solar net energy metered solar is one aspect of the behind the meter cost, right? Because that is behind the meter on the side of the consumer. But uh, at the point that electricity rates rise high enough and it becomes sensible to just burn your own oil on site or whatever, then you have call it the dark Amory Lovins vision. The Amory Lovins vision, but in the monkey paw curse way where it's the worst of all worlds. It's everything he thought he was going against in terms of outcomes. So it's more expensive, but also dirtier. But also Amory Lovins did like prosperity. That's why he was accepted by by, um, mainstream politics. He wasn't trying to degrowth. He just thought there was a better growth method with less waste or whatever. Um, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in this case, There's a lot of stuff that can go behind the meter that people are choosing because they don't trust the grid 
but it's not it's not that it's actually cheaper than even the higher costs necessarily it's just it's hard to put a price on feeling comfortable in your home like if you are rich and you have a home and you're not going to move then buying more solar panels buying more batteries doing a, buying a generator all these things make you feel like you've done your duty to your family you've you've provided when you can no longer trust the public the utility to provide People have a lot of problems with utilities in a lot of places, but it, a lot of places isn't that the utility won't provide power. It's that you don't like what they're using to generate it, or you don't like their attitudes, or you think they're more wasteful than they ought to be, but they provide. In California, trust has declined enough, along with high prices that that get you closer and closer to the, the uh, crossover point where it is actually, if you're going to stay, which maybe you shouldn't, it's worth it to invest in equipment that's a tiny, smaller, local version of what the grid used to efficiently do at a vast scale for you. Doesn't mean the grid can stop doing that. It just means you're duplicating the equipment. I can appreciate. And, and running it at a very low capacity factor. Like the, the kind of upfront capital cost is high and you're using this generator pretty. Right. I mean, the dream of the grid was to spend yeah. an enormous amount of money on the largest possible equipment that then was the most efficient equipment and therefore made the enormous money spread out over a very long time, over a very large amount of customers. Big investments for the cheapest rates. That's the story of modernity. And reading the history of the earliest power plants, you get a feeling of how they were making 10x jumps for several decades in a row. I mean, so from one, you know, less than a megawatt electrical capacity for the first plants to one, two, three, four, five megawatts being this crazy thing that was breaking people's minds to a 30 megawatt plant that held the record for like 20 or 30 years to a few hundred meg, like they were making these jumps up the, in these ladders, not because it was cheaper to build the plant on an absolute basis, but because it operated with an extreme efficiency and provided power at low cost that was never dreamed of in volumes to, to more customers than you could have ever imagined before. What we are doing now is we're kind of breaking that where we keep having to, we keep having the big plants and the big grid, but we're duplicating the old, the, the old world of tiny stuff for in each individual block or home or whatever. Partly it's administrative where you may not be able to control the politics of the grid in California. You may not be able to make sure they don't have wildfires, but you have an obligation to take care of your home, your factory, your office. Yeah. Uh, one of the issues, uh, Britain had a lot of these issues earlier because they broke their system earlier. They went to the market system earlier. When I was studying over there in 2012, 13, 14, I believe one of the biggest brands of supermarkets had decided that in light of not fully trusting the grid in the future and wanting to make absolutely certain that their refrigerated products would stay even in a national blackout, they invested in a series of power plants designed to make sure they had power at their stores. And then if needed, they could sell to the grid as merchant generators to help offset some of the cost. So that's some of what we're seeing. The responsibility to provide for yourself has a value that's higher than the purely just the cost of electricity coming in, replacing the cost of electricity coming in from the grid. But as the cost of electricity on the grid skyrockets, if you stay, the crossover point at which it makes sense to build your own uh, generator to take care of yourself that the economics get better all the time in a worsening world for everybody. Do you have a sense of, uh, how big of a phenomenon this is? Uh, like you, you hear, I mean, Generac stocks are going up like crazy. That's obviously nationwide, but within California, do you have any sense or data, um, to suggest how much of this, uh, kind of behind the meter insurance policy people are, I think uh, you out? should, you should probably have a battery episode soon. Not necessarily, not probably not with me, where you can ask those questions because I wouldn't want to leave your listeners with the impression that there's no utility, no pun intended, no utility in exploring, adding batteries. I look, I think electric cars, I'm going to disagree with some of your speakers and many of your listeners. I think electric cars are brilliant products that are on a path to getting better. I think that making them smaller would reduce some of the pollution issues from the tires. I think it would also reduce some uh, demands on the lithium, but I'm not, I'm not a energy or I'm not an energy or resource hawk. I don't think that chasing the smallness is good unless it makes for great products. 
because I think that that's a bad a bad direction, as I said, for reducing the total power supply. I think you're going to have unintended shortages when trying to stop immoral or bad uses of things. So if you're going to have a lot of electric vehicles, there is reason to better use your lines and wires more hours of the day by having some kind of cheap storage on one end of a small wire, filling up all the time, help leveling out the load, which is of course perfect for nuclear plants, and then locally powering your car. There's going to be energy losses with each of those stages, but it may be worth it if you have abundant, steady, cheap, clean power from nuclear. So I see some aspect of behind the scene uh, spending as good. And if rich people are super nervous about the grid and spend a lot of money getting batteries, some of those benefits indeed will flow back to the system at large, even if breaking that system in the first place is what induced the anxious rich people in building it. Ryan Pickering keeps me updated about solar and battery equipment, good and bad. He says that the Tesla Powerwall version 3 is an astonishing product, an astonishing product. I have issues with the way Elon Musk and Tesla talk about nuclear and promote 100% solar visions. But I have to say, if Ryan says that the Tesla Powerwall 3 is an astonishing product, we're going to see it being used in homes in ways that should be seen as an opportunity for nuclear, not a barrier to our tribal vision of a world of no power walls, only transmission and distribution and, and, gener and nuclear generation. I like a world of nuclear plus storage, as I've said in my storage episode with you. Nuclear plus storage is the it's, it's the ultimate solution for energy. It will kill off an entire generation of energy modeling PhDs, which is for the best. The existence of a lot of energy modeling PhDs is a sign of things gone wrong. And if we can have a world of cheap behind and in front of the meter storage paired with lots of nuclear generation, that's a vision that I'm, I'm pushing towards. Let's leave it there, Mark. Uh, we've gone over. Uh, it was definitely merited. Uh, great to have you back, man, um, to be on, on this side of the, the torrent of, uh, <laughs> of wisdom pouring forth. Um, really a masterclass uh, on the Californication of the grid. Thank you for having you back. And we'll have to make sure that uh, we don't go so long before doing it again. Uh, Marcel Boiteux is uh, in the works. Um, I think we should have you back soon for that. Um, what do you got? Where, oh, save Diablo. Very nice. Those of us Very who nice. fought that battle in California will be a band of brothers and sisters forever. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, Mark. We'll talk again soon.